Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Keto Chat. Thank you so much for being here. This marks one full week of doing these every single night. The week has flown by. Thank you all for being here and watching us and supporting. I'm so excited. As always, every night I've got an amazing lineup of people, um, the best and brightest of well, Seattle and beyond are here to bring to you uh, something to offset the anxiety and worry and everything else that's out there in the world. So we're here to bring happiness and joy and tips and techniques of how to support uh, your keto lifestyle or whatever lifestyle that you have out there, even if it's not keto. We're here to bring you all kinds of great stuff. So tonight's topic is about maintaining healthy relationships. And so right now we've got people that are quarantined at home with people that Maybe they love or maybe they don't. <laughs> uh, we've got people <laughs> We've got people like me that are quarantined at home with just cats. That's it. I love them. <laughs> hmm. uh, hopefully you have some tips for me on how to maintain my relationship with my cats right now. So um, those of you that are joining us, um, please share in the comments where you're joining us from. Um, I'm going to have everybody share where they're at. We're all actually Seattle area. I can see we've got a couple people on live, and I know some of you are watching us on the recording too. So thank you all for tuning in. Uh, let me just give brief introductions of who we've got here tonight. Uh, people are going to have all different perspectives and support and the best tips on how to maintain healthy relationships. But please share where you're joining us from in the comments. Um, so first, I'm going to introduce Leanne. And uh, I'm really excited because Leanne... She, she spells her name the same as my mom, and it's very rare. And so when somebody told me your name, I wrote it down spelling the way that my mom did. But I was like, oh, I'm sure she spells it different. But then when I looked you up, oh, it was so easy because I know how to spell it already. So uh, Leanne is an author, speaker, and creator of The Five Seasons Life, which empowers her clients deeply to connect with the people they love, the passions they want to pursue, and the big dreams they hold for themselves. Uh, and... Uh, I'll do that as a brief introduction first, but welcome, Leanne, everyone. Tonight, we also have Jennifer S. Kennett, and Jennifer is a uh, licensed mental health counselor. She has a master's degree in um, uh, therapy, and she's a couples therapist, parent educator, and owner of Eastside Couples Therapy in Redmond. Thank you so much for being here, Jennifer. Thank you. And we also have Lauren and Timmy who are the couple um, <laughs> I know I know Timmy from stand up comedy so back back when we were allowed to leave the house you guys I stand up comedy uh, we have okay so uh now now Shin I uh, probably butchering your name thank you for watching uh from Oregon thank you watching from YouTube thank you for being here um be safe wash your hands thanks for watching this uh so I I met Timmy through stand up comedy and and then that's how I met his wife as well. And I yeah. loved both of them. And then somehow we ended up on the islands of Hawaii together <laughs> in Thailand in February, back when we could still travel places. So I got to hang out with them in two different states now. Uh, love you guys. Uh, Karen Rushford, she's joining us on YouTube as well. Thank you, Karen, for being here. Um, wow, this is great. Thank you guys for being here. Um, and, uh, let me, oh, let me read your bio really Oh quickly. gosh. I wrote that in like five seconds. <laughs> I don't even know if Lauren knows what he wrote about. Oh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Timmy Booth is a comedian and co-producer of the Fremont Troll Farm in Seattle, Washington. And Lauren Ryan is a marine scientist and naturalist on the San Juan Clipper. And I'll read more of your bio when I introduce you guys officially, but thank you so much for being here. I'm glad you're here. And your yeah, special thanks for room. having us. Yeah, your new uh, video studio in your closet—that's actually yeah. great. <laughs> Rick Taylor's gonna appreciate the club comedy promo. Oh, yeah. that yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys! I'm so excited. Everyone here. Um, all right, so I think you guys are gonna be surprised. I'm just gonna call one of you first. You're all ready. Yep. Uh, I hope all right. It's random. <laughs> Well, yes, it's totally random. Uh, Le Leanne, let's start with you first. Um, okay. So again, Leanne is author, speaker, and creator of The Five Seasons Life. Um, she's developed The Five Seasons Framework as a result of a medical diagnosis in 2006 that gave her five years to live, challenging her to truly live a life she loved. 
14 years later, you guys, here she is. She's happily raising three teens with her husband of 23 years and excited to visit her 50th country this year with her family. Um, she's here. She's going to share with you how to navigate all seasons in uh, all five seasons in your relationship and what to do to make a biggest difference. So thank you, Leanne, for being here. Thank you for having me, Carol. <laughs> oh my gosh. Tell, tell us more. Oh my gosh. I'm dying to know, not literally dying, but figuratively. Right. <laughs> How did you get in this journey? Tell us more. Yeah, so um, we had just moved to Washington. I'm Canadian, so we moved from Ottawa down to Seattle. My husband was hired by Microsoft, and he was in California on a training, and I had put my two toddlers to bed, and I got up one night in March of 2006, and I was going to the bathroom. I was five months pregnant, and I just collapsed on the floor, and I fainted and I came to, but I couldn't move. So I laid there for over five hours, frozen on the floor. Mm. And after many hours of begging and pleading, I just started to surrender. And after some time, just spinning started, burning started, and I was able to move. So that set off this journey of exploration and what could have caused this brain crash. And in November of 2006, they gave me five years to live. So I worked very hard um, to prepare for dying for the first three years. And what then- was your, What was your diagnosis? What was the reason they told you? I don't you have one. They, so, they, how did they know you only had five years then? So they took all the data from the different tests that I had had. And they said, based on other people who have similar things, this mm -hmm. is most likely going to be your issue. Like you will have wow. a stroke, you will have these issues and you will die. Wow. Um, so I had three kids. My little one was just a few months old and I really spent the next three years dying. Mm -hmm. And then I decided that wasn't for me. So I started to live. And one of the things that struck me was just, every day if this was the day that i was going to not make it to to bedtime is this the way that i wanted to leave my family you know is this a relationship i wanted my kids to hold with them is this a relationship i wanted with my husband and we had really dark stormy times mm -hmm. there's no question about it but i think from this very tumultuous period i really just came up with this strategy of how do i always get back to the place that i say i want to be and so it just aligned with the seasons in my mind. And so I created this framework of the five seasons of connection. And it just helped me get back on track all the time. And it helped me teach my kids to get back on track because it not only broke my heart when I was fighting with them or we were in conflict, um, it stressed them out when me and my husband were in conflict. And then it stressed the parents out when the kids were fighting amongst themselves. So it just really gave a framework to the whole family to be, um, thinking about relationships differently. How relevant is that for what so we're relevant. going right now? Oh my gosh. I'm so yeah. excited that you're here because, you. you know, yeah. we we don't know when we can leave the house again. And right. how do you want to be living your life right now is so important. Like, yeah, yeah. it is. It's been... Um, it's been pretty incredible of a journey just for my own personal exploration, but then to see what this does to other people's families has just been a game changer. I mean, obviously for me, I live this, but to teach other people how to live it as well has just been so empowering for families because, you know, we can see a lot of things. Like we know when your hair is done and we know when you've lost 10 pounds, you know, like the outward facing self, we can all be very quick judges of, but we really don't know what goes on behind closed doors in families. And we don't know who goes to bed feeling bad about themselves and who feels like, you know, they are carrying the weight of the world from guilt, from not being the parent that they wanted to be or teaching the things they wanted to teach. So just those burdens are really heavy and that carries on, right? So when we plant those seeds in our kids, that, that grows in them and it really perpetuates. I'm seeing it now as teenagers, you know, I have the little one who I was pregnant with at the time he is now turning 14 this summer. And it was it's interesting to see how I was a different parent to his siblings than I was to him. And so, yes, personalities are different, temperaments are different and all of that, but I was a different parent. And mm -hmm. so you can really drastically see the things that I taught him that were 
very much aligned with the five seasons and how I had to come back with the other two as they were older. So they just, they implemented it differently. Mm. Um, so it's just been super relevant. And I've, I mean, obviously with this, um, you know, stay at home order in Washington and I have clients really all over the world. I've been super busy just reminding people on new systems and structures and kind of tweaking some of their older systems and structures to really speak to what we're facing now, which is 24 seven on top of each other in small spaces with no, you know, you know, with no self-expansive activities, right? We're not going to the mall. We're not going kayaking. We're not biking. We're not hanging out with our friends and growing our own personal, you know, gardens. We're really just in one shared garden and there's, there's opportunity for conflict for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh I'm, I'm curious if you can walk us through. And for those of you watching right now, how many of you are feeling strain on your relationships um, mm -hmm. in, in a variety of ways? And right. to contrast that too, how many of you are actually feeling like you're feeling closer to people than you ever have? So share with us how you're feeling right now. Um, that's, that's totally perfect, Carol. Yeah. Yeah, not everybody is in conflict in these times. Some people have found that the lifestyle that they had created was actually, you know, perpetuating some of the conflicts they were experiencing because they were just stretched too thin. Mm. So all of a sudden you might have people who have time that they didn't have, had opportunities to sit in the backyard and read a book side by side, you know, have time to cook something together, you know, where before it was takeout and it was eating on the run. So it doesn't necessarily say that because we're in these close proximities, we're all experiencing conflict, not at all. Um, but for the people who are experiencing conflict, it is, it is a very dark and stormy time because there is no out. There is no end that's just right at our fingertips we have to learn strategies to stay in connection and stay healthy with mm -hmm. our partners um, as we navigate whatever this is. I remember that in my own schooling, so I, I have a master's degree in psychology. Uh, I remember one of the things they pointed out was that um, when when family goes through tragedy, crisis, or you know something as paramount as what's happening right now in our world, it, it intensifies whatever the underlying dynamic was before that. Totally. And that, yeah. And that like, so if things were really solid before it intensifies the bond and, and right. connects them even more. And if things were rocky before it just can blow things up. So yeah. Is that yeah. It's definitely what I'm seeing. You know, I'm, I'm dealing with a lot of clients right now who are walking a very fine line, you know, between mm -hmm. despair and you know their dream life and they just they really wanted to go over to the other side but just mm. you know their perpetual conflict or their personality conflicts or you know maybe problems with the differences in their values really showed up this week and they were like oh my gosh i'm filing for divorce and it's like hold on mm. hold on let's mm. just you know deconstruct what's going on in your life right now maybe that's the path you need to take but by all means this you know this virus cannot be um, you know, the straw that breaks your back. Let's just look a little bit deeper at what systems you have in place. I am not a counselor. I mean, Jennifer is here as the trained professional, but um, I definitely kind of do that first layer of triage with people because I deal with the whole family structure. And so mm -hmm. when we look at conflict and connection in a family unit, it always starts with the parents. It doesn't, you know, mm -hmm. there's nobody that has ever come to me that said, oh my God, my kids are horrible. They're not homeschooling. They're not paying attention, you know, and I go to the children. It's never the way, you know, it's always to the parents. So um, we do walk a fine line for sure. And what has happened in our lives is, you know, expanding and for better or worse, showing us the holes that we have, you know, in our relationships. Leanne, can you kind of walk us through an overview of the five seasons, you know, kind of the, the template or maybe some, um, you know, some quick, quick tips that people that are watching right now about how, I know I'm sure it's like very in depth, but uh, sure. if you were to give the highlights and something to take away for people that are watching right now. Of course. So when I talk about the five seasons, obviously we have four that we know. In my world, when I talk about conflict and hard times, dark periods, it's always winter because we are isolated, we are shut down, we are kind of bundling into ourselves. So winter is where we don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time. 
what we do then is we create a spring cleaning strategy, just like in your house. You cannot spring clean your entire house in the same moment. It really is a systematic process. And so that is spring cleaning in our relationships where there are a number of tools and strategies that you can you know, employ to see what actually needs to be spring cleaned. It, not every tool works for every family. Um, so after you get through the spring cleaning, you really arrive in this summer space where you are the very best of yourself with the very best of your partner. Mm. And so together, you each come together whole and healthy. You aren't coming hungry and waiting for the other person to fill you up. You are coming fully, completely, wonderfully awesome and ready to engage in a, in a fully healthfully way. Um, fall will happen when, you know, weeds pop up in the garden and we're so busy being happy. We didn't notice the subtle signs. Maybe they asked us a question and we bark something back, or maybe, you know, their socks on this, on the floor is just enough, or maybe they don't close the door when they're using the bathroom, you know, and it's just pushing us a little bit out of our summer space. And that is fall. The fifth season obviously isn't found on the calendar. I call it the crossroads and it's that moment, you know, where you see the socks and actually there's a sock on my floor right now. So I'm, I'm looking at this sock and I can decide, you know, do I either say, Hey, you know, we really need to work together to keep our space clean. Um, is there a different system that you'd like to have put in place so we can both make sure that happens or you pick up the sock and you beat them up over the head and you'd be like, stop making a mess. Da, 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 you know? So the crossroads <laughs> is really that moment where you choose, do I go you know, into winter, do I battle over this, you know, over this issue, or do I lead them back through love and grace to summer? You know, hey, I really work hard to keep this house clean. And this makes it really discouraging when I walk into the bedroom and I see a sock on the floor. You know, how can we fix this? Because we together are a team. And when we are in winter, we are no longer side by side, we're really in opposition. And so that is where conflict grows the deepest and the darkest. So mm. that's kind of the framework of how I go through all my relationships, friendships, you know, love relationships, colleagues, all of it. That's so cool. Did you like, Thanks. you just wake up one day with like a dream and a vision to just come to you or is it something that over time you, you, you piece together? Yeah, it came in a fire hose flood one day when I was being a really crappy mom. Mm. And I had stepped out, I was traveling to Toronto to present at a conference. And I just was feeling like if I died here, my kids would remember as me being this crappy mom. And so it just, I think it was just through maybe some prayer and some begging and some bleeding of the universe to guide me through this. And this system just literally flew through me and and I just grabbed a hold of it. Oh, how many of you watching right now just kind of had like chills run down you where you're like, oh man, what if this is the last moment? What if, what if my kids remember me? So yeah. what do you think of that? Like yeah. right now, would you want your kids to remember what's happening right now and how you treat them or could things be different? Um, would you be proud of that? I'm trying to think of a question that people would actually admit to answering right now. So right. Exactly. Um, if you just kind of had like an aha when she was talking about that, like type a why, just a simple why, not even the full word yes in there. Let us know that you're you're here and this is resonating with you. So um, um, I'm going to ask our other um, guests here to see if they have any questions of you, Leanne. Oh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> Jennifer. Lauren, Timmy, um, what questions do you have for Leanne? Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious about the, a little bit more about the crossroads um, and what are some of the, the qualities that uh, are, are the, the sort of the tools that really allow us to, to recognize that those crossroads? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the crossroads become very clear for you. It's a very personal journey, obviously, and they <laughs> become very clear when you go through your own spring cleaning. For some people, it really is, you know, taking a pause. If that means an absolute timeout, if you feel like you're percolating and you're, you know, you're seeing your partner or, you know, your, your spouse or your, you know, whatever, whatever relationship you're thinking of, if you just cannot see them in a loving, graceful, kind way, if you can't see them as a good person who made a mistake, 
if you're thinking of them like you're such an idiot and you've totally ruined my life and you ruined dinner and you did all these horrible things and you suck. If that's how you're coming, you need different strategies than somebody who has a different, you know, a different kind of interaction point. So really the crossroads for everybody is to pause and reflect, but it's your spring cleaning that is the, you know, the workhorse of your relationship because depending on how you clean your messes, how do you, you know, clear away the debris that happened in the wintertime? How do you repair the damage of the storms that blew through your relationship? That mm -hmm. determines what you do at the crossroads. So if you're standing there and you haven't done any spring cleaning, you really don't know necessarily how to come and choose summer because it, it just feels so far. You're just mm -hmm. so angry and you're just so seething and your temperature is so hot and you, you cannot get to that place of summer. So it's the spring cleaning. If really, if you're going to read any chapter, just read that one because it is absolutely how you define who you show up as in your relationship and who do you see when you see your partner. You know, if you see them as a loving, kind, compassionate, generous soul, your interactions are significantly different than if you think they're the spawn of Satan. Um, <laughs> so it just really, yeah. So thank you for that. It really, all the power lies in spring as rebirth. And, you know, as we're seeing right now around us, right, the flowers are blooming and things are starting to burst through the soil. That is the magic of spring. And so it is fitting that in this framework, that's where the power of your relationship lies. Thank you. I guess I have a question. Uh, since you're part of a whole family with your children and everything, how has your like family dynamics been changing a lot with the whole quarantine thing? Because I know like mm -hmm. our friend who has children is saying that like the kids are rebelling because they want to go out and stuff. Has that had a big impact on your family? Yeah, I mean, I feel like had this happened when they were littler, we would have different issues. I have three teenagers. One of them, we just got back from college. So that dynamic is super different because he's a grown up and now he's all of a sudden back in here. Um, my daughter is 16 and she blamed the entire global pandemic on me <laughs> that I am the cause of her, you know, her really social nice. life. <laughs> My my son was like that when he was younger too. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you're just like, oh, sweetie. Oh my goodness. You know. So there have been brand new challenges that I really had in my mind we wouldn't face until the summer. Mm. So some of the things like I think the biggest thing that has needed to happen in our family is just the understanding of boundaries again. So mm. what are our physical boundaries? How do we respect other people's spaces? How do we respect their time alone? You know, my youngest hasn't had his favorite person in the whole wide world around for six months, you know, because his brother was off at college. Now all of a sudden his brother's here kind of poking at him every day. Come, let's go to play the football. Let's play video games. Let, you know, and the little one is like, Whoa, wait a minute. Like, where's my space again? So boundaries have been a super huge, important piece of our conversations, just both respecting our physical spaces and our emotional and energetic spaces. You know, we have morning birds, we have night owls, how do you respect other people's energy flows? It's, yeah, it's an ongoing conversation. I really need a medal. Like I think all of us with extra people in our families right now need medals because this navigating is super intense. For me anyway, I, and for the people who are reaching out, but maybe not for everyone, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for us, yes. Any extra question for you, from Timmy or uh... I, I? That's this is. I feel like you guys are here to help us. Like yeah. we're. So... <laughs> oh, oh, that's great! Thank you, Leanne. Thank, thank you so much. That's such Thanks a so cool much. framework that you've developed, and thank you for being here for sharing. It's my pleasure. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm You're looking welcome. forward to hearing from everyone else now. I'm glad I got to go first. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So up next, I'm going to call on Jennifer. Jennifer Kennett uh, is a licensed mental health counselor. She's a couples therapist, parent educator, and owner of Eastside Couples Therapy in Redmond, Washington. I'm in Redmond myself. So yay. Hi, neighbor. Um whether you're a half of a couple whose relationship seems to have slipped sideways, a teen struggling to make sense of the world around you or their frustrated parent, or an unfulfilled adult with more questions than answers, Jennifer understands firsthand the power of being seen, 
heard and understood. The, that knowledge is one of her gifts. That and over two decades of experience as a therapist. During that time, Jennifer has forged a reputation as a compassionate, caring, collaborative counselor, helping clients achieve connection, growth, and change that they crave. Uh, she's here today to share with you the power of stress-reducing conversations. How many of you right now watching can uh, or can't wait to hear about how to how to have better communication? So thank you, Jennifer, for being here. Well, thank you. And um, you know, one of the things that I really have realized is that. Um, how couples or, or people manage stress that's outside of their relationship really is indicative of how their relationship is going to proceed. And um, so one of the tools that I teach most of my clients is the stress reducing conversation. And this is a, a chance for, for two people to sit down and really talk about what's going on outside of their relationship that may be uh, influencing how they are showing up in their relationship. And there's a really clear protocol to follow, which is that one person gets to be the listener and one person gets to be the speaker. The speaker's job's pretty easy. They just get to talk about what's going on for them at length. The listener's job is a little more, more challenging because it's really important in those stress-reducing conversations that the listener is able to start from a place of compassionate curiosity. And I talk about that as, as sort of a place where your heart gets opened and you really are, are seeing this person that you're, you're talking to as somebody who you love and want to support. And the, 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 the role of the speaker as well is to, to you know, express interest, express um, empathy. Uh, it's a chance at times to sort of relate back, I, like you're telling me this has happened and this has happened and this is how you're feeling. Am I getting it? And the, the speaker can be like, yeah, I'm feeling hurt. But the most important rule when you are doing a stress-reducing conversation is never side with the enemy. How many times have you been in a conversation where you're talking about something that's happened and your partner or your friend goes, yeah, but that other person meant this or that, or, well, don't you think you maybe you overreacted there and you just feel so shut down. Mm -hmm. And that piece of siding with the enemy is the, the, the death knell to uh, a, a helpful stress reducing conversation. It's really important when you're, you're that speaker to, to feel like you can talk about all of the feelings you had and that the, the listener is going to, to essentially communicate, we're in this together, I'm on your side. Um, and, and one of the things that, the, the other things that I think really couples struggle with is how to stay in that listening mode rather than going into problem solving. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a wonderful YouTube video called It's Not, it's not the Nail. And so any of you who, who are interested, it's, it's humorous, but it's, it's really the, the, it starts with this couple who are sitting on a couch and they're talking and the woman has a nail stuck right through the middle mm -hmm. of her forehead. And she's talking about the pain she's in. And her partner is sitting there going, but, but, but there's a nail. You should just pull out the nail. And she's like, it's not about the nail. Just listen to me. <laughs> and I mean, you know, in that circumstance, yes, it actually is about the nail. Right. But, <laughs> um, but I think we, when we are trying to talk about our, you know, our feelings around something and somebody wants to jump in with, here's a solution, the message we're getting is our part, our, the, the person listening to us doesn't trust that we're capable of figuring it out for ourselves. Uh, and so it's really, really important to just stay in that place of feeding back. I'm, this is what I'm hearing you're feeling. This is, this is what I'm hearing you've experienced. And recognize there's no such thing as an overreaction. A person's emotional experience is their experience. Um, and we, if, even though we might, as a listener, have responded very differently or perceived it very differently, their feelings are really what matters in that moment. Mm. And when I was, when I, my very first job in sort of in the counseling world was a crisis line volunteer. And I will never forget a call that I had. It was a 45 minute call and I probably said 10 words. It was just that this person really needed to talk. And, um, and by communicating that I was listening, I did a lot of, uh-huh, uh-huh. How, how was that? That was about the, the, the majority of what I was saying. And at the very end of the call, they were like, oh, my God, you've been so helpful. I can't believe all of the ideas you came up with. And I'm sitting there going, wait, what? <laughs> <clears throat> but it really it cemented to me how important it is to just 
be have a witness to our experiences. And when when we can be that for our partner or for our children, um, we are giving such a tremendous gift. How many of you have, have sort of sat there when you're a listener going, I'm, but I'm not doing anything. How could this possibly be helpful? Mm. Well, I, I want you to know that the, the gift of simply holding space for people is the most precious gift you can give them. And when you are able to just say, hey, I'm here and I get it and it sucks that this happened for you, um, but we're in this together, that person feels like you trust them and that you, that you are you are holding their vulnerability with, with kid gloves. Um, and it, it really promotes that sense of connection. So this is this is a tool that I use all the time. Um, and and I have found that, that couples, when they practice this, they learn how to listen to each other more effectively about the issues between them as well, because they're using those tools of, of learning how to listen from a different place. They're learning to listen to understand rather than listen to respond or to, to debate. Do you, uh, do you find that the couples can learn to do this on their own? Because this is my experience is that one of the per persons in the couple is going to hear this. Mm -hmm. then they're try to bring it back to the couple. Hey, let's try this. Um, and one person might understand it well, but the other one doesn't. And how within that is, is, you know, trying to get the other person, no, you're just supposed to listen. How do you, <laughs> how do you facilitate that when uh, they're both not on board, they don't understand it, and, and you have to yeah. be the speaker or the listener and also the teacher at the same time? I think that's a really great question. And, and my recommendation in that is, is if you are the person who's, who's gung-ho to try this, start as the listener because it's the harder job and, mm -hmm. and you're kind of giving it your, your partner an opportunity to shine for you because mm -hmm. you're letting them, you're letting them do the, the talking and it gives you a sense of just how hard it is to, to just be in that listening space. Um, I also think it's really important to sort of set, set it up for the, the frame of, okay, we're going to take turns. So, so this is going to be my job. I'm simply going to listen. I'm going to respond. If, if I say something, that feels like um, a judgment or, or it just lands wrong for you, please tell me because I want to learn how to do this better. And that makes it a whole lot easier to then have the, the person who maybe is a bit skeptical about this, try it out as the listener. They're like, oh, that felt really good. I Maybe I could do that too. Um, and there's there are lots of, of tools on the, you know, on the internet. You, if you type in Gottman stress reducing conversation, there will be articles and things around that uh, that come up, which is helpful as well. The other thing I tend to do is I give some, some sort of cheat sheet questions that I encourage people to use in those conversations. If you get stuck, you're like, I don't know how to to express, you know, my curiosity differently or I don't I don't know how to to, to elicit more of the story. Um, there are questions like, you know, what's most upsetting to you about this or what is it you don't like about this situation? What's the worst thing that could happen in this situation? Sometimes when we, we're, we're listening to, to try and problem solve, we don't think about that. We're thinking, how, how would I solve it? Instead of really trying to, to pull out from our partner, what are the things that they're thinking and feeling about this? And then, um, you know, is there anything I can do to support you in this, in this situation? What is it you need? You know, if, if, if you could wave a magic wand, what would you want to have be different in this situation? Or what do you wish had, had happened differently in, in the situation you went through? Those kinds of questions are really communicating to your partner. I want to know the full story from your perspective. And I'm willing to, to, to go deeper and, and explore all the, the sort of the crevices and, and facets of this in a way that maybe I haven't normally done. So those those are great questions that, and, and I encourage people to write some of those questions down on a cheat sheet because you can look down and go, huh, ha, ha, okay, there's there's a question I can ask. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I, I found, again, working with, with the crisis on the crisis line is that if I'm starting to hear the story over again, it usually means that the person has kind of gotten all of, of what happened out. And so that's that's a real good cue for me to to re reflect back sort of a summary of what I've heard. Um, so this happened and that happened and it made you really upset and that's it up. 
at that point, if you're, your, your partner is kind of nodding and you can say, do you, does it feel like I've got it? They'll be able to say, yes, I really feel like you understood. Mm. That's the point that if you want, you can ask the question, would you be open to some feedback or some, some problem solving strategies? And that's a, a, a really key piece, asking permission. Because when we ask permission, we are opening ourselves to the possibility our partner is going to say, actually, no, I don't want that. And we have to then respect that boundary. Mm. But sometimes your partner is going to go, God, yeah, I, I don't know what I could have done differently. Um, and I, I or I don't know how I'm going to handle this when I go back to work tomorrow. Uh, and so it's a chance for you, the two of you to be on the same team, which I, I you know, again, I love that you mentioned that, that idea of being on the same team, because so often couples feel like they're on opposite teams. Mm. And mm -hmm. this process really allows them to, to start feeling like they're maybe on the same team in a, in a way that they haven't felt for, for a while. I'm, I love when you all start. Oh, I was just going to ask our viewers if you yeah. I, type in a question right now that one of the things that Jennifer mentioned, like one of those questions, which one of those could you use in your communication going forward? So share with us what that is. Leanne, yes. I just wanted to say, Jennifer, I love, love, love what you said about, um, <clears throat> you know, checking in with them about where they are, because oftentimes we might think just by default, oh, the, they should handle this differently, or they handled this differently before, or three weeks ago, they would have made a better choice. But in this moment, that might be all they can do, right? That might be their best effort in this moment. So holding their best from other times in other scenarios when other stresses weren't present or different, you know, problems weren't looming, they might have made a different choice. So it really, I love what you said, like, where are they in this moment making that decision? Because who they were four months ago with a full-time job and a promotion and all of these great things is not who they are today when their job is on the line and they don't know how they're yeah. going to pay their bills, right? And they carry that responsibility. So I love that you said that. Thank you for that. You're welcome. And I, I love what you're saying as well. Like we can hold that best version of our partners. And sometimes in that moment, it can be saying, honey, I, I, I get how hard this was for you. I've seen you deal with these situations so well. And I, it, I'm, I can only imagine how frustrating it is to feel like it's not working this time. Right. In that moment, you're, you're not only reflecting back, I trust you in this moment, but yes. I know you're capable of rising above. Right. And I love that. I mean, I, yeah. I see that I do that with my kids as well, where mm -hmm. when they'll, they'll make a choice. And I'll be like, wow, this, you know, this is so outside character for what I know of you. And they they sort of stop and, and, and I'm like, but I know you're going to fix this. Or I know ah. you're going to you're going to get through this because right. that's what I've seen of you. I've seen that success story <clears throat> yeah. so often. Mm -hmm. This is the anomaly. Right. And for both our kids and our partners, <laughs> because these are you know unprecedented times they're making decisions that they've never had to make before so they might be trying on a different solution yeah. you know they might be testing something and saying oh i wonder if this will work like this and there needs to i mean as long as everyone is safe there needs to be space for people to make choices outside of the way they always did because these are times outside of what we've always lived Right. Yeah. So just holding space for your children. I know your children are grown. Well, I mean, kind of more <laughs> grown than some other listeners might have littles. But, um, you know, you are having to step back and say, oh, I hope it's a great choice. But if it's not, she can fix it because yeah. I've given her tools and she has resources to, you know, recalibrate if she experiments and it doesn't go well. Because not everything we try works. You know, some things fall flat and that's life. Yeah. Exactly. So there's mm -hmm. space for that in the relationship because the people that we love are going to do things outside of character and that need, that's their journey, right? They might need to make that choice. I think the other thing that I really love is that, that this process encourages um, couples to really focus on what are the feelings that are showing up yeah. because we can, all of us can come up with all kinds of stories as to why something happened. But really when, when, somebody reflects back to us this is what i'm hearing you're feeling it clears away the clutter yeah. you know that's a form of spring cleaning and i totally I just, again i love doing this with kids where they, they may be all over the place like this is what's going on and this is why and, and i just i hone in on 
what are you feeling right now? And I can, when I reflect back, you're really upset or you're angry or you're really disappointed. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden there's this, this, this relaxing (laughs) and the story no longer matters. Yeah. It's just about that, that feeling. And that really is teaching and modeling mindfulness in that moment so that when they, they get into that position again, they're not all caught up in the story. They're caught up. They, they, they can focus on, oh, yeah, this is the feeling that I'm feeling. And it's OK to feel this way. The story is less important. Love it. How many of you watching right now are having some ahas? And what we're talking about, too, isn't just romantic couples and relationships. This is all kinds of relationships. Your, your parents, your siblings, your friends. Like mm-hmm. These are applicable to all relationships. And right now, uh, we're being thrust into different dynamics of all of our relationships. So, uh, Lauren and Timmy, questions for Jennifer? Uh, well, I was just... I love what you're talking about, like about reactivity and stuff like that. Because, yeah, when I hear someone talking about something they're going through, I'm always like instantly like, how can I fix this? How What can I do instantly to try? Because <laughs> it sounds like you want help, you know, And but that's like a, a muscle you have to work on, I guess, is like just stepping back and listening. And do you think it's I guess my question is like, do you think it's like a muscle or is it something someone has to work on? And like start from ground one, ground like the beginning every time. Like when someone tells me a problem, it's like I feel like that's just my instant reaction is to try to fix it, you know? And and the good news is as you practice it, you get way better at it. I you know, I love the fact that that um I hear my kids when they're talking to each other, they'll, you know, one of them will, will go and say, you know, I had this situation and and her sister will say, are you looking for support or, or, or problem solving? And it's, you know, just that question, it tells me that they have, they've gotten into a motive. It's okay to ask that it's okay for either of those things to be needed, but they're really clear, getting clear on what, what is the, their role in that moment. Um, and so I think that that's a place to start is just, if you're, if you're not sure, if you find yourself jumping into, into problem solving, stop and go, Oh, yeah ask the question, are you looking for, for solutions here or, or are you are you needing to vent? And nine times out of 10, you'll, they'll say, I need to vent. Um, and then it becomes, that becomes your default over time because that's what you've, you've gotten feedback is the thing that they're needing. Um, and it's the other thing I find is that, that in most relationships, the appreciation you get from being the listener is so huge. We, when we try to problem solve, we tend to get pushback. We tend to get defensiveness from our partner or from our, from our families. Whereas if we just sit and listen, we get the thank you, I feel so much better. And the more that, that we get that positive reinforcement, the more likely we're going to keep doing it. So this is not a question of, of starting at ground zero every time. I promise it gets easier. It gets more automatic. So you could, you could literally write this question out to yourself and have it there as a reminder <laughs> Are you looking support? Do you need to vent? Or would you like problem solving? You can literally <laughs> like even read it off of a cue card. Yep. And the other person will be like, oh my gosh, thank you. Now, mm-hmm. Jennifer, I want to ask you real quick too, because this is this goes back to kind of like there was a book back, I think it was in the 90s, Men are from Mars, Women are from Venus. Do you find this does kind of go along gender gender lines, or is this more of like personality type that you know, some of us are problem solvers. Others are, are uh, you know, just listeners. Or, I, well, I will, I'm going to answer that in two ways. All of us need that listening support across the board. Whether it's a, you know, those of us who who are the, in the listening role, we do have a, we tend to have a, a tendency in one way or another. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, people who who have been uh, really good at problem solving tend to to focus on I'm going to problem solve. That's been a, a, a strategy that's worked for me. Uh, whereas those of us who like myself, who've been rewarded for those emotional connections and 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 being sort of more focused on feelings, are going to go to that as a default. Ultimately, though, because everybody needs that feeling of of being supported, it's it's something that. Um, I think as we, we get that, that feedback of it's working, we're more inclined to do it. 
And I'm, I, I mean, I, I know the men are from Mars, women are from Venus thing. And yes, there are some gender differences here, but it's not as clear cut. Um, I have talked to so many men who, who say, I am so glad that I have a partner who's willing to just, just listen and hold space for me when I'm having a tough day. So this, the, I mean, the stress reducing conversation, I recommend that, that couples do this at least two to three times a week. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I mean, I, I love the fact that my husband comes home every once in a while and he's like, I need a stress reducing conversation. And I'm like, great, you've asked for exactly what I, I know exactly what you need. I can do that. Um, oh, that's so wonderful. That's heartwarming. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Building in those, those routines can make such a difference. Um, yeah. But the more you practice it, the better you get at it. All right. Um, right now, stress reducing conversation, people. Let's, let's start an ac- acronym, SRC. How many of you think you could try this in your own relationships. Again, this can be partners, <laughs> um, family, friends, partners, non-partners. How many of you are right now? So just type in SRC if you're going to try this technique. Uh, put that in the comments for us. So I think this is wonderful. So great. Um, okay, next up. You guys ready? Dwellers. <laughs> <laughs> We have Timmy Booth and Laura Ryan. Uh, I'm going to remind you again. So Timmy Booth is a stand-up comedian, co-producer of the Fremont Troll Farm in Seattle, Washington. Lauren Ryan is a marine scientist and naturalist on the San Juan Clipper. They moved west from North Carolina when they discovered a magical drizzly land of both comedy and orcas. They were married... (laughs) They were married in 2017, and before that... Oh, my gosh... They lived in sin. Oh my gosh. And now you guys live in a closet. This is so great. Yeah. I mean, we, this is the biggest room in our house. So it's yeah. cool. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited. Thank you guys for being here. Oh, we got an uh, SRC in the chat. Yay. Oh, yes, so All right. All right. Next, and share with us so SRC who might be your first person you might attempt this with. And so. Thank you for watching. All right. So Lauren and Timmy, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I feel like we're the, I don't know, we're the here, we're the young guinea pig couple here <laughs> to learn things. We don't really have a lot of advice. So I was just like, what can we do to talk about like healthy relationships? Just, I mean, all we have is like what we've done, you know, and it, I, I, I don't know. I, I thought we'd just tell the story of our relationship. <laughs> so I came up with 10 tips for building a healthy relationship, and I guess we oh can my go gosh, I love this. Okay, so we got an SRC from Anne Marie. Oh yeah, right. we got another one from Carmen. Yay! All right, we're starting with an online trend hashtag SRC. You guys love it. You have ten tips. Oh my god, I can't wait to hear this. All right, <laughs> they're mainly just how our relationship exists. Lauren hasn't seen these either, um, and so who knows. <laughs> Who kn- these are super specific only to us. So here we go. Well, let's see. Okay, so she hasn't seen this list. No, and so I'm hiding see. the notepad on the computer. I only have the. F- okay, so, so number one. one them, I want to. So each one of them, I want to pause and check in with her and see. Oh, for sure. Her for sure. Yeah. Okay. 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 Number, <laughs> number one is be from wildly different parts of the country. <laughs> okay. So we got our Panthers hat. I'm from North Carolina. Yes, 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 yes. New York. She's from New York, and so back from sports. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we miss it. Although, yeah, rest in peace, Cam Newton. Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't know how this helped us. I guess I'm trying to think like how our relationship even exists because I feel like it's really good, but I don't know why. So it's like <laughs> almost like we're dissecting the frog here. You have to kill the frog. So our relationship is over after this. No. <laughs> That's with a joke. That's what they say about jokes. Yes, yeah. this is good. Uh, maybe uh, that I, has to. I'll pause here and let you guys know. One of the my secret formulas for these shows is that every one of them I've invited a comedian on. Hopefully, <laughs> find a little bit of comic relief too. So. Tim, Timmy's here and he drug his wife along, which I'm so grateful for. So uh-huh. we don't have anything else to do. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, Timmy, Jennifer... I'm, guessing, I'm oh, guessing that a piece of that has to do with celebrating the diversity within, you know, within each of you. That there's mm-hmm. that because you're not coming from from 
a, a shared experience, you get to, to build love maps that are, um, you know, you get curiosity about, well, well, how did that happen for you? And what was what was important about your experience in, in childhood? And um, so having those differences really can can create uh, a lot of places for uh, and opportunities for getting connected and finding out more about the other person. That is yeah. so real. Yeah, for sure. It's also fun, like being like, oh, well, this is like taking them to the places in New York or like teaching them how to cook pasta or like <laughs> Italian, <laughs> like recipes and he's like here's some grits you gotta try it. <laughs> i don't know it's no that is fun. and we always like talk about the how our how we speak differently so that's always fun <laughs> yeah okay tip number two here we go short distance and then long distance and then short distance again <laughs> so we met when we were in college and yeah our relationship didn't get off to like the best start uh, Laura, you're I, you're dating one of your friends. Is that what you're saying? No, no. <laughs> I was just way. I took. I was like way into her way fast, Aww. and then she was like, "Well, let's. This seems too serious." Uh, and then, fortunately, although it didn't seem fortunate at the time, we had some time apart. I was studying, or I had an internship in England, and she was home. So we like met each other. We're really close, and then she she voiced how she thought we were going too quickly and then we spent a long time away from each other <laughs> but <laughs> well also we started dating officially once we went back to college and then we were really close until we graduated and then we we're apart for like three years so <laughs> that was like the longer part but yeah. i think like some people are scared like they want to break up just because they can't handle long distance, but I don't think it's, I mean, it's hard, but like, what else are you going to do if you really love someone? I don't know. <laughs> but I think it gave us, you know, we're our own people at, and we're like confident in ourselves outside of the relationship. And so when we are in the relationship, we just value each other that much more, I guess. I like that. All right, here we go. Number three, be a few months younger than your wife at twenty and at twenty years old. Oh she would like buy me alcohol at bars secretly <laughs> under the table when we were back from the long distance thing. <laughs> well, I don't know the statute of limitations. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Closed now. There aren't even restaurants. What are these things you're talking about? Yeah. I don't. Know. That was so 10 years friend. ago. That's crazy. Secure. Yeah. I can't believe we've been together that long. 10 years. Wow. Wow. Oh. Anyway, so nice. we can all buy beer or whatever now. Uh, and it's then it's the weed stores and the alcohol, the liquor stores and the grocery stores are open because it's essential. So, yeah, we got to have it. <laughs> and then after that, Number four is drive across the country in a short time frame with all of your belongings in the car. That's when we moved to Seattle. And that was like, oh. during that trip, I realized like, if we can drive across the country in a short time frame with all of our belongings in the car, like, I feel like we can get through anything. And oh. that's when I like, I'm going to marry her sometime soon. Oh. <laughs> awesome. And it prepared you for this experience being quarantined. Yeah, true. <laughs> so, yeah. We were talking about that and how like it breaks people closer further apart. But I feel like, yeah, if you are in a good place, if it does feel like we're closer, we go on our, our nightly walks and <laughs> we're just yeah. trying to survive. It's like nice. It's so crazy right now. I don't know. Yeah, well, I can't yeah. imagine being quarantined if you're like not getting along with the person or people that you're with. It'd be so much harder. I can't wait to see the the Valentines that they come up with next year. Like, 